Welcome to Rice, uh, and welcome to the Rice Nobel Laureate uh, Lecture. I'm George Zodro, Chair of the Department of Economics, and I'm delighted to welcome you here today to the ninth in the series of lectures by recipients of the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. The series was created four years ago under the auspices of RISE, which is the RISE Initiative for the Study of Economics, uh, which uh, reflects the efforts and vision of our former department chair and former dean of the social sciences, Antonio Merlo. The Nobel Lecture Series has brought to RISE some of the world's most prominent economists, uh, individuals who have made pathbreaking contributions that have truly defined uh, the field of economics in many, many ways. And they provided Rice, the Rice community, I think, with an, a unique opportunity to interact with these, uh, with these individuals. The Rice Lecture Series was made possible by a generous gift from uh, Rice alum and trustee emeritus uh, Doyle Arnold. Although Doyle is not able to be with us here today, I'm sure that he'll be either watching the live stream or the video recording of these proceedings. So please join me in thanking him for the gift that made this extraordinary event possible. So our speaker today is Professor Peter Diamond of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he is Institute Professor uh, Emeritus. His accomplishments are uh, far too many to recount, but just to give you a flavor of the respect that he, that he commands among his peers, Peter has been president of the American Economic Association, president of the Econometric Society, president of the National Ac Academy of Social In Insurance, which he helped to uh, found. He's been elected to the National Academy of Sciences. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And he once got to throw out the first pitch at a Red Sox game in Fenway Park. <laughs> And I am sure that his presence here means that another American League team tonight is going to do very, very well. <laughs> uh, Professor Diamond has been uh, an expert in the social security system for many, many years, writing several books on the topic and serving on many uh, reform panels. I personally am most familiar with his work in the area of public economics, uh, where he, along with a fellow Nobel laureate, uh, James Murleys, uh, literally founded the, uh, the field of optimal taxation, uh, which uh, really is just a, a path-breaking uh, change in the way that people think about uh, public e economics and, and tax policy. Uh, beyond that, uh, he, as you, uh, he has also uh, worked in other areas as well, and the most famous, I guess, is the, the area for which he uh, received the Nobel Prize, and that's for his area, his work in uh, search and matching markets, uh, work that has been applied to housing uh, and labor markets, uh, and the work which, along with uh, Dale Mortensen and Chris uh, Pissarades, was, was uh, successful in earning him the Nobel Prize in uh, 2010. Uh, the breadth and the significance of Peter Diamond's body of research uh, is clearly simply amazing, and we're delighted to have him here with us today. So without further ado, please welcome Professor Peter Diamond, who is going to speak to us and share his insights on the topic of the future of Social Security. Let me just say I was a lot more nervous about throwing out a first pitch than I am uh, today. <laughs> Uh, a previous dean at MIT had thrown out a first pitch and bounced it short of the plate, and everybody at MIT knew it. And I was warned if I did the same, I'd never live it down. It would be in the department skit parties for the next century. Uh, so I did spring training for an entire month preparing for it. So Social Security. Uh, is not a hot topic in the current presidential campaign. I've yet to see any statement by any of the candidates about it. Uh, but sooner or later, it will be a hot topic. And from the perspective of pretty much every analyst looking at it, the sooner we try to address it, uh, the more space we have uh, to do things smoothly to address it. Uh, so I'm happy to talk about it, uh, and I know that. Uh, um, so first of all, uh, current basic financial status every year, 
the Board of Trustees of Social Security issues a report that's basically written by the Office of the Actuary, although the assumptions get cleared with the trustees. If the trustees uh, try to be ornery, uh, the closing paragraph of a trustee's report is the actuary statement about whether there's anything in the report the actuary disagrees with. That's been known to happen in Medicare, uh, but as far as I'm aware, has never happened in Social Security. So currently there's 2.9 trillion. I say currently because the report measures to the end of the year. Uh, there's probably an up-to-date number, uh, but didn't seem worth my tracking down or you were paying attention to. But uh, as the baby boomers retire in larger and larger numbers, that will be running down. And the official projection uh, of the annual report is that in 2035, the trust fund will be depleted. What does that mean? By law, Social Security cannot borrow. Social Security can only pay out money that it has. Of course, the fact that the trust fund hits zero doesn't mean it doesn't have any money because the payroll tax will keep rolling in. The income taxation of benefits, the portion of that that goes to Social Security will keep rolling in. So the current projection is everybody would get a 20% pay cut, a benefit cut across the board. Uh, the law doesn't actually say how they're supposed to restrict pay, uh, but back in 83 when the same thing almost happened, uh, that was the way the actuaries interpreted what they should do, and that's the anticipation now. The standard practice to Social Security is to make a plan which is judged adequate for 75 years. Adequate means pays all the benefits in between and ends up with a trust fund equal to the following year's expenditures. The calculation is if we raise the payroll tax rate immediately by 2.78%, uh, then there'd be enough money for that to happen. Uh, that's not with a projection of the economy, but this is in present discounted value terms relative to taxable payroll, the size of the whole. The picture that's normally used to describe this circumstance is this one. The nearly horizontal line is the income that comes in from these taxes, the non-interest income, measured, as you see, relative to taxable payroll. The solid line is the, that then dramatically drops, is what's payable given the projection of starting with the current trust fund and looking at the flows of revenues. The dotted line is what are referred to as scheduled benefits, what would be paid if there was enough money to do it and you didn't change the benefit formula. So as you see, there's a rapid rise in expenditures as the baby boomers uh, kick in. Uh, and then uh, it gets fairly flat, even has a slight bit of a dip. Uh, and then over the long haul, the projection of increased life expectancy means it's a slowly rising uh, cost rate. So as you see from the numbers, 20% benefit cut uh, to make that work, and if you go out to the end of the 75-year projection, the benefit cut doesn't get much larger. The Office of the Actuary recognizes that, as they put it, this is a projection, not a forecast, and so they build a stochastic model uh, to see how things might go, looking at historic data over the various drivers of the finances of Social Security, uh, and this is the stochastic model of the trust fund. And as you see, they're awfully sure it's going to hit zero at some point in this window. A step back briefly, 
Um, what does the public think about this? Well, the current retirees in this series of surveys, um, a lot of them think they'll be getting full benefits, that somehow this will be sorted out. And a lot of them think there'll be some cut in benefits. What's a bit further off the mark uh, is the answers to questions by uh, those people not old enough to retire. And will you be able to get any benefit at all is the way the question is commonly put. And as you see, a lot of young people think they won't get anything. It's as if that payroll tax revenue will roll in and only be given to older people and not to them. Um, that seems to be off the mark, but it certainly affects attitudes towards Social Security. And Social Security is one of those programs that's very popular. So when people are asked, how do you feel about raising taxes, uh, a surprisingly large fraction say that's an okay thing to do. In this question, they'd rather raise taxes than cut benefits, a big split in the public. Uh, in, I haven't seen any general surveys that also say both as the answer. Uh, I suspect that would do rather well if there was one. That's what normally comes out of uh, focus groups uh, that have been uh, run. By. So a little background on Social Security. Uh, it's not exactly living high on the hog. There's the average level of benefits for a worker. Uh, there is a spouse benefit. Somebody married to a beneficiary uh, gets the larger of a benefit based on his or her own history and half of the workers benefit, but adjusted for the ages at which they start. So that's the typical spouse benefit, uh, and children get uh, less. As you can see, it's not half of the average because the uh, higher earners are more likely to be married uh, and still alive as a couple. So it comes out a little different. Disabled workers tend to get less. Again, there are spouse benefits and children benefits there. Um, there aren't a whole lot of children of retirees who are young enough to be getting benefits, but a lot of children of disabled workers. Uh, and there are also uh, benefits for the survivors of deceased workers. The age distribution of beneficiaries is quite wide. Uh, I struck at uh, uh, significant fractions still collecting benefits uh, in their mid-80s and beyond. But you can see a fair fraction of beneficiaries are quite young, either dependents or uh, disabled workers. So that's the background. And the other element of context is how important as is Social Security in the income of retirees. And up until uh, fairly recently, that question was answered by looking at surveys of people saying how much other income they have and plotting out the fractions that had at least half their income from Social Security, 90% or more from Social Security. But recently, digging into tax records, looking at all the W-2s filed, one could see the extent to which workers are involved in other sources of retirement. And it gives a somewhat different picture. So almost 80% of workers are at places that sponsor a 401k. If they sponsor a Roth 401k, then it doesn't show up on a W-2, and it's not in these records. If they sponsor a defined benefit without a contribution, same thing. So this has the virtue of being highly accurate but highly accurate of only a fraction of what we're interested in, but it gives you the picture. Of those workers who could be making 401k contributions, only 40% are, and 10% have traditional benefits. 
it fits roughly with the other survey that says about half of people in any year are making contributions. Some of them do it every year. Uh, some of them are erratic of it. So Social Security is going to be a big deal over the long horizon because there's so little additional savings going on. Now I'm going to switch to history to set up the view of what we might expect of the future. I'm going to give you a bit of political history. Up until 1972, there were no automatic adjustments in Social Security. From time to time, uh, Congress expanded the program, introduced disability, which came in in the 50s, introduced early retirement, which came in in the 60s, and adjusted benefits and tax rates and the maximum earnings subject to tax by legislation year after year. For a while, the members of Congress loved it. They'd go home and the old people would say, thank you for the increase in benefits. But in the 60s, as inflation became more of a problem and this became a regular phenomenon, they often went home and old people said, why was the benefit so small? It also was rather time consuming when it became nearly an annual event. So Congress asked the Office of the Actuary to design a law which would reproduce what they had actually done in practice. So in 1972, they introduced adjusting benefits automatically for inflation without making any other changes to adapt. At a hearing before the Senate Finance Committee, Senator Roth um, asked the brand new chief actuary, I have been told that the Social Security benefit formula is improperly indexed. And the chief actuary said that is correct. They were following the patterns of Congress had done as they were asked to do. But, said the chief actuary, at the inflation rates the U.S. has historically had, this is not a problem. It won't bankrupt the system. 1972 was a terrible year to think you shouldn't worry about inflation. The next decade plus saw inflation rising rapidly and the Social Security over-indexing creating a huge financial problem. From 72 to 77, uh, there was an extended period of Congress trying to figure out what to do. That's actually where I got started. In 1974, I was a pan on a panel reporting to the Senate Finance Committee, uh, and the job of the panel was to say, yes, the actuaries are right. This is blowing up, and you need to do something about it. And then the following year, I was on another panel laying out the issues around the different kinds of fixes that took place. And then in 1977, we got the legislation uh, that is basically the current structure, which had only small changes uh, to deal with it. So in the 1977 trustees report, before the new legislation, the actuarial deficit, the thing I told you about at the start, was over 8% of taxable payroll. So they had to put in place a reform to address all of that if they wanted to restore actuarial balance. Uh, it was too far a step for them to do, but they went most of the way. So in the 78 trustees report, the deficit was down to one point. 4% of taxable payroll. That's a big change. In that 78 trustees report, they re reported that with the baby boomers starting to enter the labor force, beginning in 1980, income will in exceed outgo, the trust fund will be growing, and yes, we'll have a problem early in the next century that means a little bit behind us at this stage, 
Um, but um, we'll be okay for an extended period, even though we won't have actuarial balance. Well, that was not a good time to be counting on that, as the economy did badly uh, and then went into a serious uh, recession. So in the late 70s, early 80s, it became apparent there was a problem, that the trust fund would be exhausted, and it was forecast that that would happen with the July 1983 benefits. At the time, the computers of Social Security uh, took a long time to program to write out the checks that had to be mailed. So they told Congress there's a deadline. We will program the uh, computers to give everyone a 20% benefit cut. If we don't have a new law by, I'm not sure the exact date, end of April, beginning of, of May. And uh, Congress set to work trying to solve it, and particularly uh, a commission headed by Alan Greenspan was appointed, uh, five appointments by the President, President Reagan. He appointed three Republicans and two Democrats, but those Democrats had a rather conservative tilt to them. And then each House of Congress got five split between the two parties. And this was the picture they faced. They had to get through that period until we got a rising trust fund. So what happened in terms of legislation is the Greenspan Commission um, put in a set of short-term changes to deal with the immediate problem. Newly hired federal employees came in. Obviously, they pay taxes first, benefits later. That's going to help in the 80s. Nonprofit employees who had been out, uh, they came in, same thing. As the system got into trouble, various state and local units started pulling out of Social Security who had been there. They were not allowed to do that anymore. If they were in, they were stuck in. Then they delayed the COLA. So instead of it being in the middle of the year, it was put off six months. That meant for six months each year, the benefits were lower than they would have been but nobody ever used the words benefit cut uh, describing that. Uh, and they introduced the partial taxation of benefits, uh, and they fiddled with the benefit increase rules. On the other hand, they also took existing future payroll tax increases and moved them earlier. One of the interesting histories, given the difficulty of raising taxes, is from the beginning of Social Security until this change kicked in in 90, there was always a future payroll tax increase on the books. Congressmen would say, we're not going to raise your taxes. And sometimes they delayed it. Usually they said, oops, I tried not to increase your taxes, but I couldn't. Uh, um, so it was a popular thing to do future tax increases uh, rather than current ones. And the rules for the self-employed, which had been ad hoc, would change to the current structure, resembling both an employer and employee. So um, they couldn't agree. The commission didn't make a recommendation for what to do for the long haul. This was just to get through uh, the decade. So instead, they degree, agreed on a process that the House committee would come up with a, a, a balanced bill, and then there'd be two amendments that would be offered. And Congress would choose between the balanced bill put forward and either of the two amendments. The two members of the Social Security Subcommittee chosen to provide these amendments were J.J. Pickle uh, and Claude Pepper. This was known as the Pickle-Pepper fight. <laughs> uh, 
Um, Pickle's bill um, increased the age for full benefits to 66 by 2009 and 67 by 2027. Those of you paying attention know that's the law. Early retirement state at 62. Pepper just wanted to increase the tax rate and leave the benefit formula as it was. As you see, the Republicans were in lockstep on increasing the age for full benefits and avoiding a tax rate increase, a further tax rate increase. The Democrats split fairly evenly, so the pickle bill passed. I refer to that as a benefit cut. Even though those words don't appear, it's the age for full benefits. Why do I refer to it that way? Well, the yellow bars are what the first step in Social Security is they look at the history of your earnings. And using some indexing, they produce your average earnings over your career indexed up by wages. And then they have a benefit formula that's a function of that calculation. And that benefit formula is the benefit you get if you retire at the age for full benefits, what is often sometimes referred to as the normal retirement age, what had been 65 and is going to 66 or 67. So proposals, and that's where I've drawn this from, currently are, let's push that 67 to 70. So if you retire under, out after 2027 uh, at 67, you get 100% of that first calculation. If you retire earlier, you get less. If you retire later, you get more, and the yellow bars do it. What happens if they were to change that age to 70? Well, they do that calculation the same way, and you get 100% of it at 70. And at 67, you get 80%. So it's approximately a 20% benefit cut across the board to push that up for three years. It's not exactly 20 each of those bars if I had a ratio, but it's approximately 20 at all of them. So increasing uh, the normal retirement age or the age for full benefits is a way of cutting benefits without using those horrible words. Robert Ball was commissioner of Social Security for a long time, uh, also headed up Medicare for a while, and was a member of the Greenspan Commission. Uh, this book, which was part of a memoir he didn't finish, um, is about what happened with the Greenspan Commission. And what he explains in the book is that the commission was unable to decide on a short-run plan as well as being unable to decide on a long-run plan. And President Reagan and Speaker of the House Tip O'Neill, as the two primary players on the two parties, didn't want to see the 20% benefit cut come in if the Greenspan Commission had no recommendation and Congress didn't follow up. So they formed a secret group with Robert Ball as the representative of Tip O'Neill uh, and Baker as the representative of President Reagan. Uh, and they brought in a number of other people from the commission and they brought in some people not on the commission like Senator Dole and they worked on a compromise. And then they turned around and convince the commission to do it. So the role of a commission is normally to come up with a solution to present to the principals. Here what happened is the principals came up with a solution which they used to convince the commission and that in turn uh, gave them some political color. I mention that because it's common to say, oh, we'll just do the same as we did in 83. We'll get a commission. It'll come up with a solution, and Congress will pass it. Well, that was a near run thing. So what's happened since 1983? It took one year from 1983 for the 75-year forecast to not be fully satisfactory. It was only a small deviation, uh, so it wasn't officially an actuarial imbalance 
by three years later it was and it has been every year since. So instead of the 75 years promised originally, we're currently projected to get about 50. Not bad, uh, but not what was expected. And the plan right from the start was to build up a large trust fund and then run it down. Uh, they had hoped it would hit the one year's expenditures at the end of 75 years. It's hitting zero at the end of 50 years. Um, but anyway, that's the circumstance we're in. Well, President Clinton had an advisory council asked to come up with a plan. He went on TV trying to educate the public about Social Security, trying to drum up interest in reform. It didn't happen. President Bush formed a commission to change the system to a defined contribution system. They came up with a plan. As you know, nothing happened. President Obama, uh, as part of trying to make a grand bargain, uh, had the Simpson-Bowles Commission, and that had a special group focused on Social Security. And again, nothing happened. All of this is not a surprise, given the current circumstances, there are two options, raise taxes or cut benefits. And oddly enough, the public doesn't like that. And oddly enough, the politicians react to the fact that the public doesn't like that. So the question I'm going to explore now is what my title was. What's the future look like? Um, so let's look at the current picture, and there are two ways to look at it. The first thing is how big are those annual deficits that are running down the trust fund, and how big will they be after the trust fund gets exhausted? And as you see, they're much larger than the slide I showed you earlier of the 83 problem. This is going to be a much larger short-run problem. The second thing is if we want to get back to 75-year balance right now, 2.78% was the number I showed you earlier. As you see, the longer we wait, the worse the problem is. Remember, this is a rolling 75 years, and you're bringing in at the end years where people will have longer life expectancies. Uh, and so the problem gets steadily better, steadily worse, the longer you wait. Uh, the bigger the task you have to deal with. So let's talk about the future. Will we get legislation or will we get an across the board 20% benefit cut? Um, it seems to me very plausible, uh, and it's the case of uh, any analyst I've seen on the subject, we'll get legislation. Because while legislation will make the public unhappy, a 20% across the board benefit cut will make them very angry. So I just don't see that happening. When will we get legislation? Is it inevitable, as the last three presidents who have tried have shown, that it'll be the last minute? I think the answer to that is yes, unless there's something that really puts this on the political agenda. I have not noticed any of the candidates for president of either party, not just President Trump, but Bill Weld, <laughs> uh, mentioning Social Security. It's a non-topic. What would it take to turn into a topic? Somebody would have to be running on, we really have to fix this now, and doing that in a way that doesn't sound like they're suggesting bad news. It doesn't seem too likely, so I think last minute probably is inevitable. How do we address it last minute? Uh, I've heard people say, oh, just form a commission. It worked before. It'll work again. Again, I was telling you why that might be dicey. So if you think, as I do, something will happen, and there'll probably be a commission involved, uh, what kind of thing will happen? Um, Obviously, it depends on the political alignment between the parties at the time. I've heard it said that waiting for the last minute favors tax increases relative to benefit cuts because the tax increases can kick in right away with a, a little bit less pressure 
then the benefit cuts would, would fall. And maybe at the same time we'll consider some reform. So that's the um, kind of element, and I want to touch on these pieces. First of all, what's the political balance look like? Is it more or less the same as I showed you in 1983? Well, I'm going to compare uh, two drafted bills. The, if you're interested in this, if you go to the website of the Office of the Actuary at Social Security, any member of Congress uh, who files a bill about Social Security, the Office of the Actuary does an evaluation and posts a description and an evaluation. Sam Johnson, uh, at the time this was happening, was the Republican chair of the Social Security Subcommittee of House Ways and Means, and that's where a bill will start. John Larson was the ranking Democrat at the time, he's the chairman now, and his bill had a whole lot of co-sponsors. This is an update of the bill, but it's essentially the same. So when it came to the payroll tax, Sam Johnson said no change in the payroll tax rate, no change in the payroll tax base. Uh, John Lawson said we're going to increase the payroll tax rate slowly, uh, getting up, uh, reaching 14.8 as opposed to the current 12.8 by 2042, and that plus 178 is the impact on that actuarial calculation. Those numbers I showed you, the whole that's now 2.78, uh, this would have handled uh, 1.78 of that. But secondly, he also wants to apply that tax rate to earnings that are above 400,000. And eventually the current maximum would get up there and the system would go without limit. And that roughly doubles uh, the accomplishment of providing revenue and exceeds what's needed merely to restore actuarial balance because he's arguing that the benefits, given the cuts that happened in 83, are too low given the extent of reliance of people on it and given the fact that the rest of the pension system uh, has not shown any significant growth. So how does Larson label what he's trying to do, um, cut taxes. Well, yes, part of the plan I haven't shown you yet is lowering the income taxation of benefits. Increase the payroll tax rate. Do those words appear in the actual press release issued by his office? No. Uh, the magic words are ensure Social Security remains strong well into the future. That's code for a tax increase. What about the benefit side? Well, Sam Johnson changed the benefit formula. That helped solving uh, a bit over a third of the problem. He wanted to increase the age for full benefits, which I've just told you was another benefit cut. Uh, that was a big key piece. He wanted to end the taxation of benefits. That worked the other way. He wanted to change the way the cost of living adjustment is done. That would save money. He did want to do protecting uh, the very low earners and in fact increasing what's now a minimum benefit for very low earners. Uh, so that's how he hit his balance. And Larson was using that extra money to increase the benefit formula, to change the taxation of benefits to be more generous, uh, that's what his headline was, uh, and to change the way we measured the cost of living that would make the annual increases larger instead of smaller. So how did Sam Johnson talk about benefit cuts? Well, modernizing, updating, ensuring keeping up with the economy, and targeting benefits for most of those in need. And what does that mean? They are all words for benefit cut. So you can see the rampant sensitivity around this issue. You can see why no candidate for president is talking about it. Uh, and we can 
see the problem. So what will happen if we get there at the end? What are the options? It's now 2034. The computers um, don't need as much of a lead time to be programmed anymore, um, but there will be a deadline. What are the options? One option is sharp changes immediately in benefits or taxes. You don't get the delay you would get if we made changes now. You could phase in the changes, and doing that, you could just use general revenues. Or third, you can phase in the changes and have Social Security borrow either directly from the Treasury or selling bonds like war bonds to the general public, uh, and then paying them back. My hunch is number three is what will happen. Uh, the sharp cuts in benefits and or taxes is going to be very unattractive to Congress or the President. Phasing in changes using general revenues opens up the tapping of general revenues. The Republicans will fear that that will make the system consistently more expensive. The Democrats will fear it will become a device for cutting benefits because there are deficits. I don't think either of them want to get in that treacherous, uncertain area. If you could phase in the changes and you have a plan that the Office of the Actuary says can afford to pay it back, I think they can all live with that with the hope that none of them will still be alive the next time Social Security comes up on the agenda. Now, what about some reform issues, something different from the proposals you've seen in those two plans? Most of the plans out there are a shuffling of those same factors. Well, twice before in presidential commissions, having Social Security borrow from the Treasury was part of the reform plans. This is not something new. These were both Republican plans. Um, so I think the Democrats would borrow and repay and feel secure would go along with it. The Republicans in the past have, as have a whole lot of individual proposals. So what are some options for reform? One of them is to tap into the estate tax and not just the payroll tax, finding another source of revenue. One of them might be, instead of building up a trust fund and running it down, uh, to build up a trust fund and keep it, and use that trust fund to invest in a uh, higher expected return, higher risk portfolio than 100% U.S. Treasuries. And the third possibility is to try to spare Congress by having automatic adjustments when the system is looked at as being out of line. None of these are new ideas. So starting uh, with 1797 and Thomas Paine, he put out uh, a pamphlet. Uh, there are a lot of interesting things in and I'm just going to focus narrowly on this plan. He wanted um, to give a, a lump sum to every individual, male and female, um, when arriving at age 21. No gender discrimination. And the explanation is with a, some money there to get them started, they could start a business, they could do some better farming. Everyone should have something to begin with. And then he wanted to give what we now refer to as a non-contributory benefit to everybody over 50. Um, I have not attempted to map that into what it would be in today's dollars. Uh, and um, he also wanted to extend this to what we now have as the disability program. Um, and how was he going to finance it with a tax on estates? The other part of it talks about how the land belongs to everybody, and so the people who own it you should be paying land rent to everybody else. 
Uh, but it was a tax on the states. He was going to do it differently depending on whether it was direct descent or elsewhere. And he has extended calculations in this pamphlet on how this was enough money to handle that. More recently, going back to the website of the Office of the Actuary, Senator Holland uh, has proposed this change, up the, the state tax to back the way it was, and give that money to Social Security. I can say in the book Peter Orzag and I wrote in 2005, uh, we weren't going to mess up the text, but in the footnote we talked about this. We didn't want to distract the readers. Uh, so this by itself uh, handles, uh, I don't know, about a quarter of the problem, uh, a little bit less than that. Uh, so that's one idea that is at least out there. For the other ideas, I want to tell you a little bit about the Canada Pension Plan, which resembles our plan quite a lot. Uh, it's a bit different because we do redistribution within Social Security. Canada does it by having two separate plans, one bolstering for low earners and one for everybody else, which is linear, so it doesn't have the nonlinear benefit formula we have. And they decided in the 90s that they wanted to build up a sizable trust fund so they would, in their eyes, be fairer to future generations by having them inherit, inherit this trust fund to help pay for benefits along with the obligation to cover the whole since it wasn't fully funded. The projection they made, the target they have, is to have 75 to 80 percent of benefits coming out of the trust fund, the rest coming out of the pay-as-you-go dimension. No, I've got it backwards. Pay-as-you-go is 75 to 80. Uh, investment returns 20 to 25. They set up an independent board, not part of the Canada Pension Plan, to handle the fund. It operates like a standard sovereign wealth fund. Uh, it has uh, an amazing breadth of investments out there and no sign of any uh, interference. I don't see politically the U.S. going to a sovereign wealth fund and trusting an independent board uh, to handle it, and we barely trust the Fed to handle monetary policy. Uh, so what I think could be done to diversify the portfolio is to invest it with the thrift savings plan. The thrift savings plan is the 401k-like retirement plan for federal employees. It's got over three million uh, members of the plan. It has a limited set of options that are all index funds except for treasuries and those are handled by private firms that also sell index funds in the market and the charges on the index fund, the largest one I think is three basis points, vastly smaller than elsewhere. And what you've got to keep in mind is these compound. So back when people were talking about individual funds and saying, you know, 1% administrative fee per year, that's not bad. But if you're doing that over 40 years, on average, your money is hit 20 times. So it comes out to almost a 20% drop in benefits. So that's a Canadian idea I think we could do an American version of. And let me say Congress has done nothing to meddle with the portfolio of the thrift savings plan. The other thing they do in Canada, first of all, which must be a big relief, the chief actuary only has to do a report every third year, not every year. And he does a 75-year calculation just like ours. And if the system isn't financially sustainable, and there are two definitions. One is maintaining the trust fund at an adequate level, and the other is paying all the benefits. Then the government has a window to act. And if the government doesn't act, the payroll tax rate goes up, and the cost of living adjustment goes down for the three years to the next evaluation. It 
seems to me a, a wonderful fallback kind of mechanism. Sweden uh, has one as well. Um, I would love to see all of these reforms happen in 2034, if not before. Thank you. One more slide, a picture taken at the FDR Memorial uh, in Washington. He, of course, was the president who gave us Social Security. Professor, while I understand that there's not necessarily a relationship between Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, those terms get at least confused enough that there's some possibility of the Social Security situation being meshed in with the conversation about health care. Would you comment on that, please? Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, I think it's fair to say um, the particular place I saw it said a couple of years out of date, but nothing changes in this realm. Social Security has a problem, Medicare has a crisis. Uh, and I think that's right because Social Security is money in, money out according to rules. We control the rules, the wage money comes in, and the money that goes out is related to that. Medicare is facing the fact that health care costs are rising faster than the economy is. Uh, there's a lot of things we could do to cut back. We have the most expensive health care system uh, in the uh, advanced set of economies. We have a lot of things in it that are very inefficient. There's a, a lot that can be done to fix it. But I think even if we did, it'd still be a trend problem. And other countries that have less expensive systems, some of them not doing quite so well on delivering care, some of them doing better, they also have a trend problem. I think a trend problem is inevitable because medical care keeps getting better and that is something we then want more of. Uh, when I think about the demand for medical care, uh, I think I spent a year at the Harvard School of Public Health learning about health insurance and the like. And Elliot Friedson, a very distinguished sociologist in his PhD thesis in the 50s, was interviewing somebody in the Bronx, which is where I started. Uh, and the guy was asked, if costs were no object, what would you like for medical care? And the guy said, it would be nice if each morning as I had breakfast, the doctor stopped by and said, how are you feeling today? <laughs> now that's something that artificial intelligence may be able to do rather well. Uh, for a lot of people soon. But I think it captures the idea that medical care is just so important and so broad that this is something we're going to have to face up to as something that will not be a problem that will go away. I think these things will be kept separate uh, because the only real overlap is some of the cash flow. Uh, and I don't think and each problem is hard to address and involves such radically different things. But I will say one thing. I had a letter to the editor of the Times yesterday, I think it was yesterday, where I proposed, in contrast to what you're hearing in the campaign, uh, Medicare for all children. That wouldn't be expensive. It was a response to a Times article on the huge increase of the number of children without any health insurance. And I suggested that those children never lose it. So eventually, we'd have coverage with a single payer system, uh, whether we had supplements or not, that would save a great deal of administrative costs and give considerable more leverage in lowering the prices. Uh, that's, of course, part of the problem. It's not just drugs, it's, it's doctors, it's equipment manufacturers. Um, there's no way of getting into this that doesn't get ugly. Um, but anyway, that's the separation. I'd like to take you back to your uh, three possible remedies to the last minute solution. And in particular, your choice of the one that involved borrowing 
I mean, given the backdrop, which you covered very well, of how things go wrong when the ability to pay is based on projections that are, we know, uncertain and have proved very faulty in the past, um, could you expand on that a little bit? Or was it just simply the political expediency from a legislative perspective that somehow makes that more palatable to the short-sightedness of legislators? Well. First of all, let me say that I was indeed presenting it as my forecast uh, for exactly the reason uh, you said. But also, if those are the three alternatives because we've waited till the last minute, uh, that is also the one I would favor. Uh, I would favor it along with some of the reform elements, which would have the form, particularly the last one I talked about, that if it turns out that we're having trouble paying back, don't forget this is paying back from one set of taxpayers to a different set of taxpayers, which matters, which matters. Um, but again, we could envision either automatic or legislative changes to address that. Uh, I think the importance of having a good retirement income program uh, is such that I don't want to see it shrink. And now the question is, what's the best way of financing that if you think it's important? And certainly every advanced country has a system in some form. Uh, and they all include uh, some aspect of a pay-as-you-go part. Uh, just to give you an example, Chile is the one that everyone says this is a defined contribution fully funded. Uh, yes, it is, but it's not the only part of the pension plan. The other part, which they refer to as solidarity, is topping up the low or non-existent benefits of people. And that's just out of the budget with a little bit of funding. The Netherlands has a non-contributory benefit, like Payne was talking about, for everybody over 65, they're automatically slowly creeping that age up. It comes out of the income tax. And it means that anyone who spent an entire life in the Netherlands is getting a benefit that actually exceeds their official poverty line. I think these things are extremely important. And the issue of how should we finance them, well, I think that conversation is best held around things that seem politically plausible rather than, oh, here's the, my favorite tax of all time. Uh, and I think the, uh, some of the other taxes being talked about, the wealth tax, the much higher income rate at the top, um, I'd be inclined to preserve for other things because I think the public will tolerate a payroll tax increase for Social Security. The other things we need so badly, infrastructure increases, better education, more basic research, I think they're much harder to finance. And I, let's hook those up with the things that may turn out to be popular. We don't know. Um, why not just remove the cap on earned income that's subject to Social Security tax? that would be affecting those that could afford it more instead of increasing the Social Security percentage, which would affect everyone and not necessarily. Um, two, two responses to that. First, as you saw in the Larson plan, uh, he was doing a big part of that. So the current, I forget the exact number, 138 to 400, um, that's a politically sensitive part of the population, so it's a little bit like the donut hole in Medicare. Yeah. Uh, we've got this problem, but how much money can we throw at it? Um, but if you did pull out the cap, that alone is not enough to solve the problem. And it's certainly not enough to solve the problem if you also want to increase benefits somewhat. So removing the cap is certainly an option. The issue is how large can you push up? When you think about the taxing on the very high incomes, you have to think of all the different taxes that come together. The kinds of numbers you see uh, coming 
say, from Emmanuel Saez uh, on the optimal revenue maximizing rate on very high incomes, that's meant to reflect all of the taxes. It's not just the federal income tax. So if, I don't know what his latest estimate is, he's always reworking the data, the 73 he was talking about a few years ago, um, if you are suddenly sticking in another 12, the income tax revenue won't be there. Now maybe you can't get the increase in the income tax revenue and this is a way to get it. Uh, so I think removing the cap uh, has a lot of popularity uh, with people below the tax cap particularly. <laughs> um, but it's not enough by itself and you can ask the question, if we're going to be pushing up the income tax, do we want that full tax? Again, I go back to the uh, plan I did with Peter Orzag back in 2005 to restore balance. We wanted, as with Medicare, a partial tax above the max of about 3%. And we wanted to push up the max a little bit faster. We thought that was the kind of number which, given the other changes, would give us the balance we needed, but wouldn't get in, into the realm where you're worried about it being too large and actually losing money. This is sort of the opposite or reverse of that. How about a covert? If you, could you imagine a sort of covert estate tax? So any money paid in as a tax on somebody's income, I'll just pick up a number, above $400,000, uh, they don't ever get back. They don't what? They, they, don't, get, they don't get the benefit for that when, when they turn 65 or 67. In um, effect, people are more reluctant to give back something that they've earned than to, get some, to lose something that they never thought they'd get anyway. There are a number of proposals with removing or jumping way up uh, the max that the current um, benefit formula it, it is a three-part linear benefit formula where it's 90 percent at the bottom so the low earners are getting back a very large number um, and then 33 and then 15 so it's already fairly low and it's, some of these proposals say well let's put five percent above that so we're giving back something symbolically to say this is not separate, this is part of the system, but it's a low number. The amounts between zero and that and even the zero and the 15 are not a whole lot of money. So I think the answer is you, you do it around the politics of how it looks and it will look different to different people. Uh, but I you know, if, if it were zero instead and that was politically viable, obviously the people up there don't need the money. It's not fulfilling the basic purpose. It's fulfilling the design <clears throat> from the beginning that this was meant to look like a program for everybody, not a program for poor people. And I think of the words of Wilbur Cohen uh, in the U.S., a program for poor people is a poor program. So I think keeping up the pretense that this highly nonlinear program uh, is for everybody uh, has va value. Now the system is not as progressive as that formula looks because as I'm sure you well know, higher earners live a lot longer than low earners. On the other hand, the low earners are much more likely to be collecting disability benefits than high earners. Uh, so there are detailed studies of the extent of progressivity in the system. There's a bit there. It's not huge. Um, and these proposals will probably put in some more, but again, not huge. I view the way to answer the question is around the politics of it rather than the economics because there are good design issues and bad design issues and you want to be in the good side, not the bad side. There are a lot of really bad pension designs out there. Um, but within good, between this pretty good one and that pretty good one, can you design it so it will survive politically, open-endedly, seems to me to be just a much more important question. Yeah, one 
one more question there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, some of this discussion sort of reminds me of the HOA meeting where you say we have to replace the roof in 10 years, but beyond that we're going to be okay. So it makes sense to borrow and let a level stream sort of work all that out. And I remember thinking about this 35 years ago. There was the notion that once these baby boomers get through, everything will sort of return to normal and we'll be on a good funding basis. I, don't, I didn't see that in your, your <laughs> charts. Is that because um, the length of life? What, what are the general factors that are kind of taking away that what we thought would be a benefit when things reverse? Um, the obvious one is increasing life expectancy if you don't change the ages at which benefits kick in. So in present discounted value terms, that's going steadily up. And the concern is the way to address that is either by starting it later or without the extra benefit for the later start or by lowering it across the board. Um, and I think if you were to ask an individual, you know, the hypothetical rational economics creation, uh, we've just learned your life expectancy is much longer. You're now 21. You've got three choices. You can save more when you're young. You can consume less when you're old. And you can work longer. Uh, my guess is a rational answer is some of each. So I think the idea that <coughs> what getting through the baby boomers um, is the whole problem uh, is fundamentally wrong. Uh, on the other hand, if you think back on my slides, the scale of what they were trying to deal with uh, politically was such that they said, we're going to bite off this part and we're going to deal with it. We're going to build up this big trust fund. A uh, couple of trillion is real money even today. Uh, and then we're going to run it down to handle this transition. And somewhere down the road, somebody will figure out what to do next. Uh, I don't hold that against the people engaged in the political process, the political process has a lot of difficulties. Uh, so, um, but that's part of it. The, the second part is they're now projecting interest rates a lot lower than were projected back in the 80s because we have seen a trend to lower interest rates. Uh, it hasn't been quite the same trend in the rate of return on stocks. So part of the concern is, and part of my concern is let's have a different portfolio. Uh, U.S. federal debt has such a low interest rate in part because it's so liquid. Social Security doesn't need liquidity. It has a very predictable and long-term horizon. You know, predictable month by month well ahead. So to accept a lower rate of return because it's a liquid asset is backwards. Could we handle the risk of the swings? Well, if you had a significant fund, you could, first of all, ride it and make slow adjustments rather than rapid adjustments. Yes, if the returns are lower, it will come out of either taxes or benefits down the road. But as long as you're not doing it abruptly, which is the basic problem if you have a 401k and try to buy an annuity on a particular date, that's a very risky thing to do. If you can spread that risk out over many cohorts in many years, uh, then the extent of actual risk aversion is a lot less. So that's the second part. And then the third part is, is wage growth, taxable wage growth, uh, has been slower than what was expected. And this is part of the inequality that's getting so much attention that the um, taxable wage bill as a fraction of the total wage bill is down about 10 percentage points from 1983. Uh, so it's these three factors that, that come in. And yes, the, obviously the future is uncertain. Uh, there's no doubt about it. But it's not as if 
we're locked into something we can't change. Thank you. Thank you.